In this video, we're going to be talking about chi-squared tests. Now, what a chi-squared test is, it's a test of uh, categorical data. Now, we've looked at categorical data in the past when we were looking at proportions. We'd say what proportion of the data falls into this category and what proportion falls into the other category. Uh, and uh, we also looked at categorical data when we were comparing proportions. Uh, you know, we, when we looked at uh, uh, p hat 1 versus p hat 2. And this is similar to that, except generally we have more categories. Um, so uh, let's, just, let's just jump right in. Chi-squared tests are used to test the counts of categorical data. And actually that's an important uh, uh, point, that uh, with proportions we were looking at percentages, proportions. In this one we're actually going to count something and say, well, what's the, what's the probability of it being that particular count? All right? So uh, this is, uh, first off, we're going to be using a new kind of distribution now. Instead of looking at the uh, normal Z distribution or a T distribution, now we're going to use a chi-square distribution. And you're probably wondering, what's a chi-square distribution? Well, I'll tell you. Okay? Take a bunch of standard normal random variables. Okay? So a bunch of Zs. Independent Zs. So this one doesn't affect this one, doesn't affect this one, doesn't affect this one. Okay? And so there, there are your different Zs. If you square each one of these and then add up the sum, that's what a chi-squared distribution is, okay? And you may be wondering, well, how many z's do I have? Well, you might have different numbers, okay? Remember how t distributions had degrees of freedom? Chi-squared distributions also have degrees of freedom, okay? And so if you add up, I said k, of these squared normal random variables, what you're going to get is a chi-squared distribution with k degrees of freedom, okay? This guy right there, that's not an X. Looks like an X, it's not an X. It's a chi, another Greek letter, okay? Now, incidentally, just like you can, uh, you can create a chi-squared distribution, chi distribution from a, uh, a normal distribution, the T distribution actually comes from a combination of normal random variables and chi-squared random variables, and that's where we get our degrees of freedom with the T distribution. I'm not gonna tell you exactly how it works, uh, because you're, you're likely not interested. Uh, so, and also it's not part of the curriculum, okay? So let's move on. Uh, let's look at our chi-square distributions, okay? This, uh, this yellow guy right here, that is what the chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom looks like, okay? So just looking at the yellow one, if you say, well, how much data is going to fall in this part right here? Well, as a matter of fact, it's going to be 68% of the data. You know how I know? Because this is between 0 and 1. Think of a standard normal random variable. 68% of the data is between negative 1 and 1. And so if you square that, it's between 0 and 1. So 68% of your data is there. 95% of your data is between 0 and 4. Why? Because 95% of the data is between... Uh, uh, two standard deviations below the mean and two standard deviations above the mean in a standard normal random variable, you square that and instead of from negative 2 to 2, you get from 0 to 4. Okay, so you see how it works. Um, this green guy here, that is a chi distribution with two degrees of freedom. Uh, as you can see, these are all very skewed to the right. Okay, they, they, uh, uh, both of these, they're just diminishing all the way down. Uh, once we get to chi distribution, distribution with a three degrees of freedom, it now has sort of more of a mound shape that we're more used to, but it's still very skewed off here to the right, okay? The mean of a chi-squared distribution is the degrees of freedom. So the mean of this yellow one is one, the mean of this green one is two, the mean of this light blue one here is three, the mode for all chi-squared uh, distributions of 3 and up is always going to be degrees of freedom minus 2. So the highest point of this curve with 3 degrees of freedom is at the point uh, is, is when x equals 1. Uh, this dark blue one here is 4 degrees of freedom, and the highest point, the mode, is when x equals 2. Okay. The mean, however, would be over here, and the median would be somewhere in between the mode and the mean, okay? Remember, the mean is going to be to the right of the median because it's skewed to the right, all right? 
This is not super important. I just want to give you an idea of what these distributions look like. So if you have a chi-square distribution with eight degrees of freedom, and you're saying, and, and you have a particular test statistic, statistic uh, you'll be able, able to have an idea of, okay, well, how does that relate to eight? Is it a lot bigger than eight? Is it around eight? Okay. Uh, so let's go on. Chi-squared tests. So, uh, like I said before, they're used to count the, to test the counts of categorical data, and uh, in particular, what we're trying to do is we're comparing the counts that we see, the counts that we observe, with the counts that we expected to see. All right. Uh, and that's what our null hypothesis is going to be, what we expected to see, okay? Uh, there are three types of chi-square tests, okay? One is the goodness of fit test, one is a test of independence, and one is a test of homogeneity, okay? These two guys here, the test of independence and test of homogeneity, really, really similar. As always, we have our assumptions and conditions, okay? Uh, this says assumptions, I should have said assumptions and conditions. Uh, the data still has to be collected randomly, just like any type of hypothesis test. Uh, the, sec the second condition, uh, usually we expect to see independence there. Um, the independence is actually built into the randomness. Uh, the second uh, condition is that we have to be counting something, not measuring how tall it is or how heavy it is or anything like that. No, counting something. And then the third condition is the sample size, just like when we were doing proportions, n times p had to be bigger than 10, n times q had to be bigger than 10. Well, this time, each of our, each of our counts, each of our, our values has to be at least uh, 5 in each category, okay? So to ensure that we, uh, that we can use a chi-squared distribution, we have to have 5 in each of these categories, okay? And I'll show you what I mean in a second. Uh, so what is our test statistic? What we're going to do is we're going to take our observed value, minus our expected value, we're going to square that difference, divide it by the expected value, and then sum it up for all of the, uh, um, for all of the, the, the values that we have. Okay? And this particular statistic is used for all types of chi-squared tests. Okay? So, let's jump into the goodness of fit test. Okay? So, with the goodness of fit test, we are given a particular model of counts. For example, uh, we, might, we might be given something like, this distribution is uniformly distributed, meaning uh, uh, that uh, uh, we should have an equal number of counts in all the categories. Or there are, in this particular uh, um, population, there are twice as many women as men. Okay, So then we would look at that and would say, well, okay, I would expect that out of 240 people, I'm going to have 160 women and 80 men. So that's how I come up with my expected uh, values. All right? The null hypothesis is always the same in a goodness of fit test, and that is the model is correct. Okay, it's a good model. The alternative hypothesis, no, it's not. Okay, we don't say it's not correct in one direction or another uh, because actually it would be hard to. We have so many variables here; it would be hard to tell exactly which direction we're talking about. Uh, we just say it's not correct. Okay, so in that case, it's a little bit like a, a two-tailed test. Um, and then uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the model that we're given and with the particular sample size that we have, we calculate the expected number of counts in each category, like I said, and then we compare this expected data to the actual observed data that we get. All right? So here's a good example. Fortune magazine collects the zodiac signs of 256 heads of the largest 400 companies. Is there sufficient evidence to claim that successful people are more likely to be born under, the, under some signs than others? As always, as soon as you see the magic words, is there sufficient evidence to claim that that's the alternative hypothesis, okay? Evidence means alternative hypothesis. So our, our alternative hypothesis is going to be successful people are more likely to be born under some signs than others, and our null hypothesis is going to be, no, they're, they're equally likely to be born under any of these signs, okay? So we look at our data here, and it looks like, uh, ooh, looks like there's a lot of uh, Pisces that are uh, successful. And it uh, looks like it might be kind of a bummer to be Gemini or Libra. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't know, maybe, maybe those differences aren't big enough to be significant. Uh, let's see, okay? 
So, the null hypothesis, like I said, successful people are no more likely to be born under some signs than others. In other words, the distribution is uniform. And the alternative hypothesis, successful people are more likely to be born under some signs than others. So, uh, our sample size is 256. We have 12 categories. So that means we would expect, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, to have 256 over 12, which gives us 21 and a third people in each category. Yes, you can have fractional people when you're doing your expected values, okay? Remember, because an expected value is not what we really think is going to happen, we think somewhere close to that is going to happen, okay? So, uh, let's see. Uh, our conditions. Uh, we have to assume that the sample is randomly chosen or it's representative of all the CEOs, or actually of all successful people. Um, we are looking at counts, that's a good thing. And uh, each expected value is at least five. Uh, let's go back. What was our expected value again? Oh yeah, for every single one, the expected value was 21 and a third. That's more than five. So uh, that works. Okay? Conditions are met. Let's do it. Here are all of our observed values. There's Pisces. There's, uh, what was it, uh, Gemini and Libra, something like that, that weren't, uh, weren't very high. Here are all of our expected values. And... Again, the chi-squared statistic is going to be the observed minus the expected squared divided by expected. And uh, what does, so uh, what we do is we do 23 minus 21 and a third. We take that difference, we square it, we divide it by 21 and a third, put that right there. Then we do 20. Uh, the difference between 20 and 21 and a third is going to be 1 and a third. We square that and we divide it by the expected value and we put that right there. We do it again again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and then we sum it all up, okay? Now, when you sum up the observed and you sum up the expected, it better be the same sum. If not, boo-boo somewhere, okay? Uh, but that's not really what we're interested in. What we're interested in is this one right here, okay? This is our chi-squared statistic. Once we sum up all of these squared differences divided by the expected value, we get uh, this value of 5.094. That's our statistic. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, oh my God, I don't want to do this. It's okay, okay? This is why we have calculators. Now, I'm using a TI-83 here, and what I do is I pull up my, I can click on stat and uh, edit, and it gives me my lists. Here in L1, I have put all of my, uh, observed values. Here in L2, I put all of my expected values. And really, let me tell you, I'm going to save you some time here. The easiest way to do it is do 21 plus 1 third, okay, get that, store it into X, and then when you pull this up, you can just go X, enter, X, enter, X, enter, X, enter, and it pops it on down there. It's way easier than hitting 21.333333, enter uh, each time. Uh, and you'll see this, it just says 21.333. There's actually more digits there. Okay? Then, to get our differences, squared differences divided by the expected value, I put my cursor on top of the L3, and I say, I'm going to make each of these values L1 minus L2 squared divided by L2. Why? Because that's observed minus expected squared divided by expected. And when I do that, I get... It just pops it on in there. Okay? Then after that, I can go back to stat and go to calc and then do the one variable uh, statistics and I can look at my sum that way. Or, alternatively, I can hit a second stat to get my list and then I can arrow over to math and right there where it says sum, I'm going to select sum and uh, it's going to put sum right there and then I'll say second three and that'll give me uh, L3, and that tells me that my sum is 5.09375, okay? So, that's my statistic. And uh, so what I did is I just saved that into X, and then using my second distributions, I went over to the chi-squared, there it is, chi-squared CDF, and I chose that, and I said, Give me a chi-squared distribution, give me a CDF, that is to say I'm going to get the area under the, the curve, 
And I want to know what's the probability that I would be between this 5.09375, which I put into x, and this is just big number, okay? I want infinity, calculators can't do infinity, so I just put a really, really huge number with 11 degrees of freedom. Now, you might be saying, 11 degrees of freedom, where'd you get that from? It's real easy. Number of categories were 12, right? Subtract 1, 11. It's that easy, okay? What do I find? I find uh, this is my p-value, 0.9265. What does that mean? It means this was not weird data at all. There's a 92.65 chance of getting data at least that weird. So what that tells me is, no, I don't have evidence of anything, okay? There's my statistic, my test statistic. Now, remember how I said earlier that in a, uh, uh, a distribution that has k degrees of freedom, that the mean will be k? Well, I have 11 degrees of freedom in this dis distribution, and my statistic is only 5.094. If the statistic is less than the, than the degrees of freedom, you're not rejecting anything here, okay? You're going to have a really huge p-value. And sure enough, that's exactly what we have, a really big p-value. So we don't just fail to reject it, we really, really fail to reject the null hypothesis, and we do not have evidence that successful people are more likely to be born under some signs than others. Okay? So, that is our uh, goodness of fit uh, um, uh, test. Okay? Now, one thing that I want to show you when you're thinking to yourself, why, why did you take the number of categories and then just subtract one? Okay, we have 12 categories here. Why did you just subtract one? Well, remember, the distribution that we're looking at, we're saying, we already know, when we came up with our expected value, that's because we already knew that we had 256 total uh, people we were looking at. So as we start throwing them into these different classes here, there's 23 in this class, there's 20 in this class, there's 18 in this class, each of these numbers are kind of like random variables. They, they, can, they can be different values. Once we get all these filled in, this has to be 29. It has no choice. Because I have all these filled in, and I have 256, there's only 29 left. They must all be Pisces. That is to say, that last category, it didn't have any freedom. These other 11, they did. So we have 11 degrees of freedom. Okay? Now, let's look at the test of independence. So, this test is used when you sample a population, and you want to test to see if two variables are independent. The null hypothesis is always, yes, they are. They're independent. The alternative hypothesis is, mm -mm, they're not independent. There's some sort of association between the variables. Okay? Now, again, we're going to be comparing observed values to expected values, but this time, we come up with the expected values using the assumption of, uh, of independence. Okay? Now, let me tell you what I'm talking about. Let's say that we look at 114 students, and uh, we, we, uh, we check out what color their eyes are and whether they're left-handed or right-handed, okay? So we just grab 114 students and then we categorize them all. We, we uh, collect this data. And here are the data that we, uh, we get, okay? Uh, so, what do we do? Step one, get some totals here, okay? Let's get some totals over here and some totals down here. How many total brown-eyed people do I have? How many total blue-eyed people do I have? How many total green-eyed people do I have? How many total left-handed people? How many total right-handed people? Okay? Now, once you get those totals, now you can figure out, uh, using your assumption of independence, what your expected values are going to be. And this is what I mean. Uh, we have 19 total left-handed people out of a complete total of uh, 114 people. So that means, in each of these I categories, I want 19 over 114 of those people to be left-handed, okay? As it turns out, 19 over 114, I believe, is 1 -sixth. So that means I would want 1 -sixth of 42, which is 7, to be in the left-handed category, and the rest of them to be in the right-handed category. 1, 1 -sixth of 33, which is, I think, 5.5, will be in the left-handed category, and the rest of them in the right-handed category, okay? And then I'll just fill it in from there, and sure enough, there are my uh, expected counts, okay? Now, um, if you're having trouble with this, 
a pretty easy way to do it is, let's say I want to get this expected count here, okay? Take this total, so the, the total of the column, multiply times the total of the row, divided by the total total. And you'll get the, you'll get the correct answer every single time, okay? So, we are ready to go uh, with our test here, except, ruh row, we got problems. Those aren't greater than five. Oh, man. So, uh, now some of y'all are probably chuckling with glee right now, saying, ha ha, some of our values are less than five, we don't have to do the test. Yes, you do. You do have to do the test, okay? What do we do? Look, we got this other category, right? Well... Um, I'm just going to throw my green-eyed people into the other category, okay? Instead of saying, I have brown eyes, blue eyes, green eyes, other, well, the green-eyed group didn't end up being big enough to kind of hold its own. So we're just going to say, brown eyes, blue eyes, and other. So I'm going to lump these all together, and uh, there we go. Now I put uh, the, the green eyes in with the others, and so now we have at least five in each of our uh, uh, expected values there. Um, you're also going to have to do the same thing with the observed values, right? You're going to have to take the green-eyed people and throw them in with the other category. So just make sure that you do that. Okay, so now we are ready to, uh, to go ahead. Uh, I believe we, uh, that these people were uh, uh, randomly selected, and um, we're definitely looking at counts here. We're not measuring anything else. Okay? So... Uh, Again, we use the exact same test statistic. The degrees of freedom are a little different this time, okay? This time, we take the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one uh, to, to uh, calculate our degrees of freedom. So let's go back here. We have two, don't look at the total row, okay? Two columns, three rows. So that means we're going to have two minus one is one, three, min three minus one is two. We're going to have one times two equals two degrees of freedom. So this is going to be a chi-squared test with two degrees of freedom. Another way you can do that is just cover up the last row, the last column, and cover up the last row and just count how many cells you got left. Okay? Two. All right. So this is a, uh, a, a chi-squared test with two degrees of freedom. Now I would just take all my different values. Uh, there's our, our, those are our observed values. Those are our expected values. I'll grab my calculator again. I'll do the exact same thing we did last time. Those are my observed values, my expected values. I use the same formula for L3. I pop in those, uh, the difference squared divided by the expected value, and uh, I sum it up. I get this sum, which you might notice is a very low sum. Uh, I store it into X and I say, what's the probability that I would get something between that sum and a big number with two degrees of freedom? And I get a probability of 70%. So again, that's a huge p-value. So that tells me there's my chi-squared statistic, the 708, the 0 .708. Again, that chi-squared statistic, that was the sum of that column. All right? And uh, the degrees of freedom was 2. The, uh, the probability that I would get a, a test statistic this large is uh, um, 70%. So again, we fail miserably to reject the null hypothesis. I don't care what your alpha is, it's not that big. Okay? So uh, we, again, do not have evidence of any kind of association between eye color and handedness, which, frankly, I don't find surprising at all. Okay? But wait! There's an easier way to do this. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. You'll be pleased I showed you this. Okay. On your calculator, go to matrix. Okay, it's second and then this button right there. Okay? And uh, what you do is uh, er take your cursor over to edit, and we're going to edit the A matrix. And what we're going to do is, uh, there we go, we're, uh, we're, we call it a 3 by 2 matrix because we have three rows and two columns, and then, in this part right here, we fill in the data that we have, okay? These are, this is directly from uh, what we had before. Here are the left-handed people, here are the right-handed people, brown eyes, blue eyes, other, okay? So, you fill in that data into your matrix A, and then, second, uh, no, I'm sorry, not second, then you go to stat tests, and you go down to find the thing that says 
chi-squared test. If you have a TI-84, you might also see chi-squared GOF test. That's goodness of fit. Don't do that one. That's not a very... I didn't even show you that because it's, it's not a very useful test. Uh, it's easier just to do it with, uh, with the lists. Uh, but yes, do select this. And what you'll see is something like that. Observed, matrix A. Expected, matrix B. Calculate, draw. Okay, we already put the observed values into matrix A. Don't worry about the expected values in matrix B. It'll do it for you. Uh, that's the nice part, okay? So now we just go down to calculate, and what does it tell us? It tells us the chi-squared statistic is 0 0.708, that the p-value is 0 0.702, which we already saw, and our degrees of freedom are 2. That's, that's really all you needed to know. So, uh, uh, so this, this is a nice little test button. It does it for you. There is one more thing that I strongly recommend that you do, and that is go back to your matrix uh, menu and uh, go back to edit, and you'll see that there's now a matrix B in there. Look at it, because those are your expected values, and you've got to look at it and make sure that all of these numbers are at least five, because if they're not, you haven't met your conditions. So that is an essential step to this that a lot of people overlook, but you don't want to overlook that. Okay? All right. Last thing, chi-squared test of homogeneity, and then we're done, all right? The only difference between tests of independence and tests of homogeneity are in the data collection and the hypotheses. Otherwise, they are identical, okay? In uh, your independence test, you have one sample with two variables, like the eyes and the handedness, okay? Your null hypothesis is that the variables are independent. With a homogeneity test, you have more than one sample from more than one population, okay? Well, you basically have one sample per population, but you have lots of different populations. And then your null hypothesis is the populations have identical proportions. The test that we did before, we could have done this as a test of homogeneity, but this is what it would have looked like. I would have said, I'm going to go, uh, sam I'm going to go find a sample of right-handed people. So I'll go to this population of right-handed people and get a sample. And then I'm going to go over to another sample, of, to some room of left-handed people, and I'm going to grab a sample of them. Okay? These two samples are independent of one another. I already know they're independent, so I don't have to test independence. Okay? The samples are very independent. So now what I'm going to see is, are the proportions the same? Are these two populations homogeneous with respect to eye color? Okay? That's what I'm testing. Uh, whenever you see uh, chi-squared tests that are done with different nationalities, it's almost always a test of homogeneity because it's really hard to just grab a whole bunch of people and then say, now what nationality are you and what nationality are you? It's a lot easier just to go to Germany, grab a whole bunch of Germans, go to France, grab a whole bunch of French people. Okay? So, but other than that, the, the math and the, the, the procedures are exactly, exactly the same. And uh, that's it. That's chi-square tests.